starts on time. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome. Welcome to uh, the Digital Curation and Stewardship Session of the MIT Summit on Grand Challenges in Information Science and Scholarly Communication. Um, we're thrilled that you're here, um, whether you are here in the room or joining us via the live stream. Um, this, uh, this event, this summit, is, uh, is funded through a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation. And our goal for this summit, um, the entire uh, uh, summit, is to identify and prioritize specific grand challenges in each of three targeted areas of information sciences and scholarly communications. So we just spent a day and a half um, delving into and identifying some grand challenges in scholarly discovery. For the next day and a half, we're going to dig into digital curation and stewardship. And then on Thursday, we will dig, Thursday and half a day Friday, we will dig into uh, grand challenges in open scholarship. What we're trying to do is identify central questions within each challenge area that would pave the way for building an information science and scholarly communication research agenda for the broader community. Um, we're attempting to identify uh, research projects that are feasible, that are doable, um, that would help us get some traction on some of the grand challenges that we will identify over the next, uh, over the past day and a half and over the next however many days, three days. Um, so, so keep that in mind, that that's our, that's our end goal here. Um, for each of these challenge areas, we've gathered in the room a diverse group of domain experts, and, and these folks will make connections with one another, with the work that they're doing, with the work that we want to do into the future. And we uh, already from the first day and a half have seen that there's a real um, desire to continue these conversations and continue to collaborate on tackling what we've identified as, as some of the grand challenge areas. Um, let me note that all of, um, that the keynote this afternoon, that will start in a few minutes, will be live streamed. Um, we hope also, for those of you who care to, that it will also be live tweeted. Um, so the hashtag is MIT Grand Challenges, all one word, so feel free to um, tweet using that hashtag. I will remind the folks in the room that uh, because we are being live streamed, any um, comments or questions that you have after the keynote will also be live streamed. So, so be aware of that and that is your speaking is your consent to be streamed. Um, so I appreciate that. And let me back up now uh, a little bit before I introduce Phoebe and introduce myself. Um, so my name is Chris Berg. I am the Director of Libraries here at MIT, and along with my colleague Micah Altman, we are the, the co-principal investigators um, who dreamed up this uh, Grand Challenges Summit for you. And um, later on, I will introduce uh, to the folks in the room the program committee and the other folks who are, who are bringing this together, and we'll give you all a chance to introduce uh, yourselves to each other. Um, but for each of these areas, we have asked some really wonderful folks to come and, and kick off each of the day and a half of conversations with a keynote address to get us thinking and to sort of broaden our, um, our thought process and, and broaden the range of things that we will bring to the table as we discuss these grand challenges area, areas. Um, and to introduce today's keynote speaker, I've asked my colleague uh, from the MIT Libraries, Phoebe Ayers. Thanks, Chris. Um, good afternoon. Imagine a world. Imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all. That's the vision statement for the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs Wikipedia and its sister projects. And it's aspirational, and I think it's also inspirational. Every person in their own language with the ability to freely share and access and help curate all knowledge. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Phoebe Ayers. I am the computer science and electrical engineering librarian here at the MIT Libraries, but I am also a Wikipedian. And it's in that context when I, that I first met Anasuya Sengupta. Um, she was the chief grant-making officer of the Wikimedia Foundation until 2015. And 
I want to say that Wikipedia is many extraordinary things. It's, uh, but most notably, it's supported by thousands of volunteers who focus in areas from writing articles to writing conferences to writing code. And these volunteers come from all over. They come from different places, they speak different languages, and they really might not have much in common at all, except for a passion for free knowledge, and may I just say, a really, really, really strong interest in copyright law. <laughs> um, so at Wikimedia, Anasuya, along with her staff, she coordinated these unruly, copyright-loving volunteers to build participatory, cooperative grant-making systems that extended the scope and reach of Wikimedia. And these grants included everything from supporting individual photographers who wanted to document their country's heritage on Wikimedia Commons, but couldn't afford a good camera to do so, to building national level staffed chapters um, that supported volunteers and coordinated outreach. Anasuya also coordinated the Wikimedia Foundation Global Strategy on Diversity, and she brought to all of this work her, her past experience as a program director at the Global Fund for Women, where she gave grants to women-led organizations all across um, Asia and the Pacific Islands. Before that, Anasuya coordinated and led a partnership in India focusing on police responsiveness to domestic violence, which program became a model internationally and within India. And she has also worked as a researcher on topics as diverse as equality in civil service organizations to the effectiveness of maternal health campaigns. And so in her work, in her work as against religious and cultural fundamentalisms and for sexual and reproductive rights, she's founded campaigns, evaluated the outcomes of programs, facilitated strategy, and brought her work as an activist to bear. Over her career, Anasuya has written and spoken widely, including editing a book entitled Defending Our Dreams, Global Feminist Voices for a New Generation. She's also an award-winning poet. Anasuya holds an MPhil in development studies from the University of Oxford, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. And she also has a BA in economics from Delhi University. In 2017, she was granted a Shuttleworth Fellowship. And currently, she sits on the board of directors for the Nonprofit Quarterly and also for The Rules, which is an organization that aims to change the rules of global systems. She's also an advisor to the Internet Archive and to Equality Labs. And in all of this work, all of this work, plus the fact that she speaks no fewer than six languages, um, gives her a deep understanding of how to build communities. At Wikimedia, Anasuya brought her knowledge that groups need more than just money to thrive, and that you have to be radically inclusive in your processes and proactively reach beyond your existing boundaries of who participates in order to have a truly diverse outcome. So, by the time that I met Anasuya and we became deep friends, I had already been involved in Wikipedia for many years. I was involved in Wikimedia Foundation governance and I had, in addition to editing, had written and taught Wikipedia, written about and taught Wikipedia. But I think Anasuya, more than anyone else, guided me to critically interrogate that inspirational idea that lies behind Wikipedia. Imagine a world with our current structure, can every single human being share in the sum of all no human knowledge? Whose voices are represented in the encyclopedia? And do those who don't participate have the resources, the time, the education, and the cultural capital that we implicitly ask of our contributors? Are they vulnerable to harassment or outnumbered by those who don't value their work? With Wikipedia's insistence on outside published sources is the arbiter of reliability, are we privileging Western and colonial ideas of how knowledge should be represented? And what about the topics and people who have never historically been written about? And though Wikipedia aims to have an edition in every written language, how can people participate in a world where most information online is in English? How do we capture the world's missing knowledge? And all of these questions led to Anasuya's latest project, which is called Whose Knowledge? Whose Knowledge is a global campaign to center the knowledge of marginalized communities on the internet, 
whose knowledge gives Anasuya and her co-founders a way to convene unlikely allies and push beyond the boundaries of what it means now to be a Wikipedian or to be a contributor to any public knowledge project. Um, with her amazing co-founders, fellows, advisory board, partners, and volunteers, Anasuya is leading whose knowledge to create campaigns around the world that empower those who have been historically left out of both processes to create knowledge and out of conversations around internet freedom and security. To quote their site, whose knowledge is a radical reimagining and reconstruction of the internet so that together we build and defend an internet of, for, and by all. Anasias and Gupta. Okay, so she made me, made me cry. Um, and it's funny, I, when someone who is very special to you, a friend introduces you, you almost don't recognize yourself in that introduction. So thank you, Phoebe, for such a generous, generous introduction. Um, it's extraordinary to be standing before all of you today in my sari. The first seven years of my life were mostly spent in a pretty remote part of South India, an arid and intense region on the Deccan Plateau, a desert. There we are. Um, that's Hospet, where I spent my first two years. Eight hour overnight trips to Bangalore were the limits of my imagination and my horizon. I can safely say that my seven year old self could never have imagined the adventures I've had since, from Bangalore to Berkeley to Boston. And even as an adult, frankly, I don't think I could have imagined being here, being at MIT um, in any way, shape, size, or form, not until Chris Berg and I had this really delightful conversation late last year. Where is Chris? There you are. Um, so thank you, Chris, for that delightful conversation and everything that's come out of it. Thank you, Micah. Thank you, Phoebe. And thank you, all of you in this room, for being part of my journey in known and yet to be known ways. I am conscious, really conscious, of my privilege in being here. And I hold this honor very, very deep. But I do not and I cannot hold this honor alone. I bring with me into this room the most amazing gift I possibly can give you, the richest gift I know the galaxies of voices, the constellations of faces and minds and bodies who have deeply, deeply inspired me through my life and who may never have the chance to be here in this room with you. I may only be able to share some of their scholarship and some of their stories, but their lives, their worlds, their imaginations may well be affected by what we discuss and do in this room over the next few days and beyond. So over the next 45 minutes or so, let's hope, um, I hope to share with you just a little bit of the responsibility that I feel and a great deal of the enormous possibility that I imagine. So, hello everyone, Maharaba and Namaskara. I greet you in English, in Arabic and in Sanskrit because I am indeed Thomas Babington Macaulay's monster. <laughs> Who is Macaulay and why am I obsessed with him? Let me begin by saying that symptomatic of a great deal I might say in this talk, the Google algorithm and I do not agree on Macaulay's relative importance in my life. When I search for Macaulay online, the Google knowledge graph gives me Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> on the other hand, Wikipedia does have a great deal to say about Macaulay. In 1835, Macaulay wrote an infamous minute on education that dramatically changed the education system in India. It made it primarily English-centric for the Indian middle classes. He had this to say about language and scientific knowledge. The dialects commonly spoken among the natives of this part of India contain neither literary nor scientific information and are moreover so poor and rude that until they are enriched from some other quarter, it will not be easy to translate any valuable work into them. 
I have no knowledge of either Sanskrit or Arabic, but I have done what I could to form a correct estimate of their value. I have read translations of the most celebrated Arabic and Sanskrit works, and I have never found one among the Orientalists who could deny that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. <laughs> Now, there are many fascinating ways to engage with this colonial artifact, <laughs> and South Asian scholars have done it with prolific abandon. But I am invoking Macaulay's ghost today for one particular reason, to reflect upon Macaulay as a historical curator of astonishing power in deciding what gets preserved and how it impacts whom. Later in the same text, Macaulay says, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern, a class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. I am Macaulay's monster because he is the reason I stand before you today speaking in a language that we all share and invoking a system of knowledge that we all understand. I am born into a family that speaks six different languages, but the language that has really triumphed over this polyphony is English. It is the language in which I primarily think and speak today, the language in which I studied science and literature and economics. Yet it is not entirely the language of my knowing, and it is only partially the language of my being. But being Macaulay's monster is not a simple and unidimensional existence. That would be too obvious a story. So English is not the only imperial colonialist language of my subcontinent. Arguably, Sanskrit, in turn, has been the colonizer of at least a third of India's population. The Adivasi, our indigenous peoples, or first inhabitants. The Dalit, those formerly and pejoratively known as the untouchables. And the Bahujan other communities considered much lower on the caste order. For many of them, English has been the language of emancipation, of resistance, of escaping the oppression that is the Indian subcontinent's caste system. I was born into a Hindu Brahmin upper caste family, a community of people turned by the British from being priests to becoming bureaucrats, basically managing everybody's daily lives from the sacred to the banal. And of course, whether through scripture or bureaucracy, upper caste Hindu men have always held power over women of any class or caste. So I stand before you today as both oppressor and oppressed, a multiplicity of identities and histories that helped me in a sense to be the best possible monster that Macaulay could have ever hoped for. In this complex, conversation of many languages and, the no and knowledge systems in this journey between Macaulay and MIT, here are a few overarching critical questions of epistemics that I'm grappling with right now, and I hope will frame some of the conversations we have. What is scholarly or form formal knowledge? Who or what arbitrates its authority? Who participates in curating and preserving this knowledge and how? And whom do these processes of curation and preservation impact, and how? Before we try and answer some of these questions together, um, we've all had a wonderful lunch, and um, I'd love to do a little exercise with all of you. I know that many of you turn green at the thought of a, an icebreaker. I, too, do. But I beg of you your indulgence for two minutes. I would like you to turn to your neighbor and ask each other three questions. So those are, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think about the printing press? What is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the radio? And what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the California gold rush? And go right ahead, have your conversation. You're also welcome, if you're not the sort to have a conversation, to think of it in your head. <coughs> Well, 
conversations afterwards, but I hope you got some of it in. Yes? Yeah? More or less? All right. Since it'll take too long to go around the room, I will offer you some of my first thoughts. What do I think about when I think about these three things? And let's do a little comparison. The printing press. Korea and China printed books much before Gutenberg and his Bible was published in 1454. Wood blocks, metal, movable types, they had it all. China printed woodblock books from the 7th century AD and movable type from the 10th century, and a metalloid type Buddhist doctrine was printed in Korea in 1377. The radio. In a complex history of the radio, as we know, Jagdish Chandra Bose, a scientist from Bengal, South Asia, is the one most overlooked or forgotten. In 1894, at the Kolkata Town Hall, he ignited gunpowder and rang a bell using microwaves. That's a year before Marconi began field testing his system in Italy. And the California Gold Rush. The Gold Rush was a period of systematic state-sponsored genocide for the Native American communities of California. One account has miners killing up to 50 Native Americans a day. Okay. Let's do a little exercise of curation and preservation. How many of you had similar thoughts to mine on all three questions? Oh, uh, right. <laughs> well, there's a reason you and I know each yes. other for a long time, Saina. Um, how many of you had entirely different thoughts? Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, it is, in a sense, what it means to curate and preserve knowledge differently. Um, I chose these three examples to show three different technologies that do this for us in analog and digital forms. The book, the radio, and the internet. Mm -hmm. So what does the California Gold Rush have to do with the internet? Funny, you should ask. In November of 2016, Siko Batters, one of my co-conspirators, um, at whose knowledge, attended the annual gathering of North American Wikimedians that Phoebe organized. And she facilitated a discussion with Michael Connolly Mishquish, a scholar from the Kumeyaay Nation, a Native American community whose land stretched from Southern California to Baja, Mexico. Mike is an engineer and economist who teaches at San Diego State. He's also an expert in environmental science and cosmologies, including physics and astronomy. Siko, Siko asked him what Wikipedia articles he would like to work on with a bunch of experienced and enthusiastic Wikipedians. That's not an invitation you get every day. So she expected, you know, the article on the Kumeyaay or possibly an article on Kumeyaay physics or astronomy. Mike came back with, I want to edit the article on the California gold rush. Mm. Why is that? Mike had realized that the entire Wikipedia article on the gold rush was written pretty much from the white settler perspective, and to invoke Macaulay again, couched in the language of progress. The section on the impact on Native American peoples was hardly detailed, and yet for Mike and the indigenous communities across California, the gold rush was systematic genocide. Even more telling for Mike, the picture that was on the Wikipedia article was the one on the left, which shows an Indian, an Indian, um, slaughtering the white settlers. So that day in San Diego, Seiko with Mike and various other Wikipedians worked on the article and changed the picture to the one on the right. That is the picture that is carried on the English Wikipedia article to this day. So I want to step back for a moment 
and offer the disclaimer of a passionate Wikipedian and Wikimedian. <laughs> because, as you know, I'm both of those things, as Phoebe pointed out. And I love the sense of possibility that is inherent in the internet in its many forms. Yet, like many things I love, I think that Wikipedia and the broader internet deserve my best efforts at tough love. So, is the world better off because of Wikipedia and the internet? Yes, it is. Can Wikipedia and the internet do better for and by the world? Yes, we can. Si, se puede. And can we in this room, as knowledge scholars, as practitioners, as technologists in one form or the other, do better in the ways we think about the world and its knowledges and what we do to preserve them? I believe so. So who we are has an impact on what we create and how we create it. Who we are has an impact on what we cu curate and how we curate it. And what we curate in the present is what we are creating for the future. As curators, as preservers of knowledge, we literally decide who should be seen in the world and how, who should be heard in the world and how, and whose memories should be preserved and how. And we are simultaneously readers, consumers, users of this knowledge. Who we choose to see, hear, and preserve has an impact on what we choose to see, hear, and preserve. The California Gold Rush article gets 5,000 page views a day. The article on the Kumiai barely gets 100. So for the rest of my time here, I want to do three things. I'd like to offer you the overview data that might help us understand the scale of some of the challenges and the opportunities before us today. I would also like to offer um, sort of somewhat sketchy conceptual framework that might help us get to next steps which in turn is some of the practical organizing principles and questions for a research agenda. I'm so aware that these are highly complex, non-trivial problems. All of you in this room and beyond have been thinking about key issues of preservation and curation for a very, very long time. I, we all, we stand on your giant shoulders, the librarians of Congress, thank you, Carla Hayden, the DPLA, the MIT archives, the techies who created TCP IP, the Internet Archive, thank you, Brewster. Because of you, I'm hoping we can see further than ever before. So sometime in the middle of 2017, we passed an important milestone in the history of human connectivity. Somebody used the Internet for the first time and the world's knowledge and the world's global population is now online by 50%. So 50% of the world's global population is now online. We know that digital access is highly differentiated. Not everyone gets on the internet in the same way or in the same forms. At the same time, this is a critical moment in internet history and world history, and it feels like the milestone has somewhat gone unnoticed and unmarked. So who's online and from where? Places like the US, the UK have almost reached internet saturation, many of you know that, while countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America are home to billions more users who will come online in the next few years. But what's significant is not only those who will come online in the next 10 years that we're looking at as our time horizon here. What's deeply important is to understand who is online today. North American and European users together make up only about a fourth of the world's online population. Three-fourths of the world with digital access is currently, right now, from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Yet what's online is not reflected in whose knowledge that we see and experience on the internet. So, at the Oxford Internet Institute, the GeoNet project, led by Mark Graham, who is one of our advisors at, at Whose Knowledge, has done some amazing work, some of the most significant research on online information geographies. Their work shows that content on the internet remains heavily skewed towards rich Western countries. There you go, that's a really interesting graph. Um, all of Sub-Saharan Africa combined, despite having only you know, having 10% of the world's internet users registers only, well, less than 1% of the world's domain names. And domain names are a good proxy for how much web, web content is produced. 
um, and just half a percent of the world's commits to GitHub, which is a proxy for how much computer code gets created or shared in a place. France alone produces almost six times more GitHub commits and more than three times domain registrations than all the countries of sub-Saharan Africa put together. And it is not because Africans cannot code. So let's come back to Wikipedia, to the spaces that Phoebe and I call home. Wikipedia is also the best proxy we have right now for public online information, open access, collectively created. Wikipedia is astonishing, as Phoebe said, in so many ways, including, of course, from the point of view of quantity. It currently has over 45 million articles in nearly 300 languages written every month by over 70,000 volunteers from around the world. In comparison, the Encyclopedia Britannica, when it went digital in 2012, had 65,000 articles, a few language versions, and was written by about 4,000 collaborators and contributors. Yet both quality and quantity are impacted by who produces what content. Wikipedia is one of the most obvious examples of the curator and preserver being simultaneously the creator and the interpreter. We know that only one in about nine or 10 Wikipedians might identify as female. We don't have stats for the small number of non-binary transgender contributors, but make no mis mistake, they do exist. One of the other critical gaps is geography. Only 20% of the world, primarily white folks from the global north, edits 80% of Wikipedia currently. That's quite the visualization. The vast majority of content on Wikipedia written about most African countries is written by editors in Europe or North America. A third critical gap is language. Wikipedia is far more multilingual than most other platforms in the world today. Let's not get me wrong. Wikipedians understand what that means in both social and technical ways. But there's a long way to go. You might speak Mandarin, Bangla, or Arabic, all of which are in the top 10 most spoken languages of the world. But there are only 52,000 articles in the Bengali Wikipedia, a language that is spoken by 237 million people, one of whom is me. While the Dutch Wikipedia has nearly 2 million articles, a language spoken by 28 million, one of whom is not me. Every language version of Wikipedia is different. The acts of creation, interpretation, and curation are therefore hugely different. That is by no means a bad thing. In fact, I think we should be celebrating it far more than we do. But it brings up some really useful political and practical issues, including of translations between versions, and we can come back to that later. So, where are we? 20% of the world or less shapes our online understanding of 80% of the world through geographies of domain names and Wikipedia articles. This obviously causes an amplification of these biases, including of gender and place, when you're looking at search engines like Google. If you're using Google to search for local information in Belgium or in Canada or in Australia, you're served up primarily locally produced content. But if you're in Sierra Leone or Pakistan or Indonesia, looking for local content through the lens of Google or Wikipedia, you're getting content from the rest of the world. And even more interestingly, if you're sitting in the UK and you might be white and British, then you're wanting to read about Sierra Leone, you're getting content written by someone who looks like you. Now let's look specifically at scholarly communications because that's been the focus of our work here. Um, it's hard to find really good research on book publishing, and I have to talk to Brewster about this, but the most complete survey of, uh, by language by UNESCO is from 1995, as far as I could see, and it at least gives us trends. It found that nearly 22% of books published the previous year were in English, with a not-so-close second being Mandarin at 11%, though in 2013, China published the most books. None of the Indian languages were in the top 10. And there's far less spread when we look at scholarly journals. 45% of the journals published the previous year were in English, with German at 11% and Mandarin at 6.5%. In terms of scientific journals, we have 
slightly more recent data from 2012. Macaulay has spoken. English is predominantly the language of the scientific community. Roughly 80% of the journals indexed in Scopus are in English. So given this data, if the knowledge held by the majority of the world is marginalized on the internet, women, queer and indigenous communities, communities and, the, and languages of the global south, how do we center them going forward? Thinking about the global from this perspective is both a significant ethical choice and a strategic one. Let's be honest, the baselines are pretty low. With a little bit of effort, we could do a whole lot. So many communities are waiting for us to do this work. And most critically, we must be ready for them to lead and participate in the knowledge work about them. So let me sort of offer you a small conceptual framework. The nature of knowledge, of course, has been at the center of human thought and conversation and fierce battles ever since human beings started to talk, think, and fight with each other. So I'm not going to do a run through over the next 10, 10 minutes. But in order to provoke a research agenda, here's my conceptual frame for the way I think about a truly global, inclusive sense of knowledge. Global as, a, as an exciting, if messy, constellation of multiple locals. I began to think of knowledge not as a binary, but as a continuum between embodied and disembodied knowledge. Embodied being held orally, visually, audially, and disembodied being held as artifact, books, journals, newspapers, CDs. Um, we tend to privilege disembodied knowledge in multiple ways, but Michael Polanyi may give us a way forward. Polanyi was a Hungarian-British scientist who did path-breaking research in the physical sciences. He also had some fascinating insights into knowledge as he pushed back on a positivist vision of the world. Polanyi said essentially that formal knowledge, which I'm calling disembodied knowledge, comes out of tacit embodied knowledge. And what is it that makes embodied knowledge disembodied? It's the act of making embodied knowledge explicit. So when you make embodied knowledge explicit, when a dancer dances, it's embodied knowledge. When a dancer talks about her craft, it becomes disembodied as you make the interview about her dance, right? And of course, this is a recursive bi-directional process. Disembodied knowledge cannot exist without embodied knowledge. And once it's created, of course, in turn, it affects embodied knowledge. See all the scholars I'm invoking right now. Um, I also believe you cannot address this continuum without addressing the two versions of authority. People's authority, that is the legitimacy given by an individual or a community of people who offer a particular system of knowledge, and institutional authority, or the legitimacy offered by a formal scholarly edifice, like a university. In other words, at the heart of a post-colonial manifesto for digital knowledge is the act of making explicit multiple forms of embodied knowledge and the authorities that either legitimize or delegitimize them. It is also the act of making explicit the ways in which power and privilege are embedded in our ways of knowing. I want to emphasize at this point, as, as Stuart Hall does, that when I use the terms post-colonial or the West or the global South, I am not referring to physical geographies. These are systems of power that classify, compare, and construct hierarchies of knowledge. What the so-called upper castes of India have done to the so-called lower castes through a completely fictitious and constructed social hierarchy, what we have all done to our indigenous peoples around the world, what we have all done to women around the world, these are forms of domination and suppression of knowledge. My ancestors, your ancestors, and in many ways, all of us in the present are unfortunately deeply complicit in the ways in which we have made some knowledge more equal than others. Miranda Fricker is a wonderful feminist philosopher who has uh, a way of calling these hierarchies of knowledge epistemic injustice, the wrong done to someone in their capacity as a no. She basically draws a distinction between testimonial injustice and hermeneutical injustice. Testimonial injustice is when you don't believe a person because you don't believe the community they come from. 
when the police do not believe a black man on the streets. Hermeneutical injustice is when you don't believe a concept, when you don't have a sense of the social experience of someone. So when a woman, for instance, talks about sexual harassment in a culture that does not recognize sexual harassment. Some of us might be familiar with this. How do these concepts translate into practice, into our everyday work of curation and preservation? In 2011, two friends of mine, Priya Sen and Achal Prabhala, Achal is another whose knowledge advisor, made a really significant film called People, Our Knowledge. I'd like now to stop talking a little bit and give them your, give you their voices. Let's see if we can do this. It's seen that interviews are proprietorial because they're the product of an individual's labor. Um, in this, there's an entire structure of authority built around this. The historian acts as the intermediary between the archive, whether it's a written archive or an oral archive, and his audience. And by doing so, he gains authority. He also frames the archive in the ways that he wants it to be framed. Now, the interesting question is, what happens if we open up that process? That suddenly, the audience has complete access to the archive which the historian's basing their arguments on. There's no reason right now that every single journal article can't, couldn't have not only just the written sources um, hyperlinked as footnotes, but also oral interviews or video interviews hyperlinked as footnotes. But in that case, suddenly that entire structure of authority disappears. If you start letting people have access to your interviews, um, and particularly in such a way that you can get a sense of nuance and context, then suddenly the authorship of the text is opened up. It explodes in multiple ways. And so the very authority on which the discipline of history is founded becomes much more uncertain. Um, but that's also quite exciting. Our countries, I mean, I'll stop it, exciting. Um, because of course it's both challenging and deeply exciting. So apart from telling you how Amarula is made, which is a very important knowledge discussion, um, let me just make sure I have this right. Uh, there we go. All right. Apart from telling you how Amarula is made, um, this film does so many important things, and I'd really urge you to go watch it. It is on Wikimedia Commons, openly licensed. Um, first, it pushes us to recognize how much of the world's knowledge systems are oral. A few years ago, as Google was doing its mass massive digitization project, Google Books, they e estimated that the world from the beginning of publishing time, including Korea and China, um, have published 130 million books in 480 languages. That's the best projection we have. The world has over 7,000 languages and dialects. If we use language as a proxy for knowledge and culture, which I think is a reasonable proxy, my back of the envelope estimates tell me we have only about 7% of the world's knowledge and language 
captured or preserved in books. One of the earliest inspirations of my life was a 12th century woman poet called Akka Mahadevi. Her vachanas or sayings have come through 900 years to continue to inspire me to this day. For me, Akka's creativity is not any less than that of the poet, say, John Milton, whom Macaulay and I both love. So I'd like to emphasize here that orality is not only about communities who have deeply established oral traditions of passing on history and knowledge. And orality is not only about the global south. Orality is also not only about the far past, which is often the way we think about it. One of our partners, Opvir, is an LGBTQI community from Bosnia, Herzegovina. They are in the process right now of creating the most fascinating and powerful oral history archive of queer activists who have been involved in the Bosnian War of 1990s. There they are, opening the archive. At the same time, they're writing Wikipedia articles on the well-known activists that they are interviewing. Yet for Oakview, the spoken narratives and counter-narratives of gender, sexuality, safety, and security are far more powerful and have a meaning beyond text. Azra Kaučević, that's Azra right there on the right, one of the founders of Oakview, expresses this beautifully about the testimonies that they've recorded. The lover and the beloved, the oppressed and a rebel, a writer and a survivor, live, name, and tell of the realities, of the wounds, of memories, of desires, of finding meaning and sense in environments of systematic destruction and collective disconnection in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In living, naming, and telling, we transform our experiences. We move together. In moving, we create bonds of love, bonds of solidarity, bonds of the different, bonds of negotiation, becoming a threat bridging the cleft, becoming power in our bridges. That is what justice means on an everyday level. As Uchel's film also shows us, confronting the issue of oral knowledge helps us think further about authority, about who legitimizes and makes credible the claims of what is knowledge and what is not knowledge. Another remarkable, amazing community that we work with is the Dalit, and I've referenced them multiple times already. Dalit literally means ground down or oppressed. And it's one of the self-identifiers for a community of an es estimated 300 million people in India and the diasporas, whose history, knowledge, and very existence have been under threat for millennia. We work with a group of Dalit feminists who lead the organization's equality labs and Project Mukti. Mukti means freedom in multiple Indian languages. And they're co-founders of Dalit History Month, which came out of being inspired by Black History Month. Last year, we worked with them to put their knowledge on Wikipedia. One of the most significant struggles we faced was establishing secondary sources that would be accepted for citation. Surprise. <laughs> to quote Mari Zwick Maitre, the research director at Equality Labs, like other indigenous knowledge, much of Dalit knowledge and history is oral knowledge and in primary sources. However, platforms like Wikipedia have very poor infrastructure for the representation of oral histories. Together, we've been working to legitimize Dalit history within white and Western pedagogical structures. Needless to say, these efforts have not been <coughs> easy. When she says they haven't been easy, with customary generosity, Mari is understating the case. Over the course of a few months, 99 editors worked on over 2,000 Wikipedia articles. And yet, over the course of a few days, one senior experienced Wikipedian systematically began to revert or delete many of those edits. Many of the deletions were based on the claim that the text was inadequately sourced. In other words, citation needed. This definitely male, possibly upper caste editor of Indian origin could not recognize the historical reasons why Dalit perspectives or Dalit-centric histories had so few written sources. Dalit scholars, in fact, have really only been published in the last 20 years. For Mari and others, these forms of deletions and the nature of the rationale offered for them feel like one more form of online trauma suffered by a community that has suffered many forms of offline trauma. 
At the same time, the opportunities, the radical nature of this work is so critical to understand and to celebrate. Mari goes on to say, some of what we are doing and encountering has often felt so profound when placed in historical context. Dalits and other caste oppressed people were not allowed access to reading, writing, learning for millennia. It is deeply momentous to be able to bring our people and bring their voices and find a pathway to self-representation on a platform like Wikipedia. Working on the internet in this way is not just self-representation, but really acts of protest and transformation. As she says, self-representation, recognition, is deeply meaningful and powerful to all of us who have been left out of knowledge so far. So finally, some next steps. I promise you, I'm getting there. In order to determine a research agenda, you might want to try thinking about changing the way we think about research and design. Lily Irani, Kavita Philip, and others call this an alternative sensibility in their article, Post-Colonial Computing. I urge you to read it. As they define it, and it's true for curation, it's not a project of making better design for other cultures or places. It's a project of understanding how all research, design research and practice, is culturally located and power laden, even if considered general. So one of the things I've been saying is, when you in the US think about local and global, your local is my global. Linda Tuhiwai Smith, a Maori scholar from New Zealand, offers different ways of thinking about what she calls indigenous research in her wonderful book, Decolonizing Methodologies. She quotes this example saying that Maori research is related to being Maori, is connected to Maori philosophy and principles, takes for granted the validity and legitimacy of Maori, the importance of Maori language and cultures, and is concerned with the struggle for autonomy over our own cultural well-being. Indigenous knowledge and research are a significant area of current research in many parts of the world, and we should know far more than we do. So this leads me finally to my three research areas and questions. There we go, people. Curation. What do we curate? Who does this curation? Preservation. How many forms and languages do we pre preserve in? How do we preserve oral knowledge better? How resilient is this content? And then you cannot do this without citation. Whose knowledge do we cite and how? Because we do not cite those we do not know. For us at Whose Knowledge, these questions can only be answered if we do two critical things. First, center the leadership and scholarship of marginalized communities in curating and preserving their own knowledge. And second, create deep allyship and alliances to support that. With oral archives, for instance, we're exploring how community archives can partner with formal institutional archives. The Bosnian Archive of Queer Histories is working right now with the Internet Archive to make sure that their local website doesn't get taken down under attack or censorship. If community archives like that could be partnering with archives like MIT or Berkeley, for instance, this would be a way of exchanging tools, methods, and imaginations in a way that we haven't thought about before. With sources and citations, for instance, we're exploring how community scholars can partner with institutional scholars. So the Dalit and Native American scholars that I've been talking about are now writing a paper together um, on their own knowledge production, which is being published in the International Feminist, Feminist Journal of Politics, IFJP. It's a mouthful. IFJP is a leading peer-reviewed feminist journal of international relations. And through this collaboration, we hope that we get a citation that helps anchor their work. So perhaps the next time that Mari or Michael talk about their work or write on Wikipedia, they don't get hit with a citation needed template. I invite you all to think deeply about how research can be solidarity in action an exploration of what global knowledge means to us today in its many local forms, and what it should mean to us in 10 years' time. I urge us to have courage as we do this. This is tough work. It's radical work. But then every one of you in this room 
you're trailblazers. You have done things that people have not imagined or thought possible. I know you can do this. And as we do this, let's remember that credibility, that getting the facts right needs multiple truths and multiple perspectives. Just as many eyes make bugs shallow, many knowledges make global knowledge possible. To end, I'm going, go, go, I'm going to go back to Macaulay, my friend of centuries. My obsession with him, really, begins with my mother's obsession with him, as things so often do. She's a writer and teacher who has all her life wrestled with the contradictions and messiness of being a monster of Macaulay's making. And my mother, like so many other mothers, was the first person who inspired me to transgress, to push beyond the limitations and boundaries of gender, of race, of caste, of class, of language, of location. I end by honoring her. I quote from a play of hers, Keats was a tuba, in which Macaulay plays a very significant part. The speaker is an Indian professor of English who teaches at a university near you in the United States. <laughs> I have taken from the Englishman what was his. I have smoothed it and dented it, given it shape, polished it, fashioned it the way I want, and I know I possess it now. When the monsoon breaks, when bodies embrace, when the child is born dark brown and glistening, who can hear the words for the thunder? My life trembles with meaning, and yet whatever I say, the words I use, they're inadequate, they're an approximation. But then I realize that the inadequacy is my victory. It's the wealth that sustains me. Do you hear me, Macaulay? I have my revenge after all. Across land and water, over hills and desert, language and knowledge are a traveling. They can never arrive. Tanubad, shukran. Thank you for listening. We have time for questions, and uh, we are being live streamed. So uh, either speak up, as I am, or there is a microphone here. We don't have a wireless mic to, uh, to pass around. Um, but I'd like to, I mean, that was just amazing. You've uh, taken what I think many of us think of as a technology challenge, and you've turned it into, I think, a, a social, a cultural, uh, uh, an epistemological, um, a social justice, a moral challenge, um, which I think it needs to be opened up to. Um, so thank you for that. Questions? I have a question that requires maybe a distinction that you didn't quite make about formal knowledge, which is the distinction between the underlay of assertions, like the sort of equivalent of the knowledge graph, and the presentations of those assertions in articles or oral presentations or something. So, if there's a sort of a presentation layer, which is an overlay and a knowledge underlay layer, mm -hmm. then the question is, you gave some statistics about so how much of the presentation layer is in English. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I'm curious about is how much of the underlying level is only presented in one language? Mm -hmm. How much is only presented in English? How much is only presented in language other than English? <laughs> that's an excellent question, and I think that's a research problem. We have very little data. I can't tell you how difficult it is for me to get the data that is possible to back up what I intuitively know, right? What my communities intuitively know. So that's an excellent question. And all I can offer is that at the end of the day, the artifacts of knowledge, as we're, you know, the presentation layer, as you put so beautifully, are a proxy for what is the underlying layer, right? And at least it gives us a trend. And so if they're a proxy for that, then we are woefully, inadequately looking at the deep levels of knowledge. And part of it, and that's what I'm trying to push us to recognize, is how we in our own minds, unintentionally perhaps, 
do construct certain notions of what knowledge is and whose knowledge is to be preserved. Um, hi, uh, the wonderful, uh, important, impactful, challenging talk. Um, very practical question. I, I do a lot of work with minority language communities. Uh, some of the work that my organization, Global Voices, does is with communities like Malagasy speakers in Madagascar. One of the problems we find is that when people want to document knowledge from their communities, they have very strong incentives to do that documentation in dominant languages. They are much better rewarded in many ways writing about Madagascar in French or in English than they are in Malagasy. And so even when we're bringing people to the table to do efforts like the, the wonderful Dalit Editathon, there's the question of what knowledge base should we be expanding or extending? How are you thinking of these questions of when do you want someone to be sharing their local experiences in a global language to change the agenda versus when do you want to document the local language at the same time? How are you navigating that territory? That's such an excellent question. And where do I begin? And let me just begin by saying how much your work has inspired me over the years. Sitting in Bangalore, I was reading My Heart is in Accra. And Global Voices, many of your Global Voices contributors are friends and partners. So thank you for that, Ethan. And thank you for that question. Um, it's such a good question. And I think what we do um, at Whose Knowledge is work with multiple communities around the world, as, as I spoke, um, and with multiple partners. We're, in a sense, as, as Phoebe said, we're in the business of, these, of a strategic convening of unlikely allies. And as we do this, it's also a convening of sometimes unlikely spaces to be doing this work. And so let me use a Wikipedia example, or a Wikimedia example, in fact. First, we ask communities what they themselves would like to do, because that is self-determination. It is very importantly their choice. And as they think about it, of course, you, you want to give them all the information they possibly can have to make an informed choice. And one of the things I've brought up as an example to help them decide, because we are often having questions I mean, exactly that. Is your Dalit knowledge going to be on the English Wikipedia, or is it going to be on Marathi, or Tamar, or Bangla, right? You know, um, are you going to write Native American history in a Native American language, the Kumeyaay, or not, or in English? And one of the examples I offer is that if you want your knowledge to be understood by others in the world, then you might want to choose one particular form of knowledge production in that global language, or let's say dominant language, right? Um, and that might be English in some parts of the world, it might be Spanish in other parts of the world. We've had conversations with the, um, with the YU, for instance, in Colombia. And if you want to preserve your language, which is very, very important, you might think of other forms of preserving that language. And for Wikipedia, for instance, it could be Wiktionary or Wikisource or, and this is so important, audio files of your language, of, of the words. We are losing languages at, what is it, 100 a month or some awful rate like that. How do we make sure we're preserving them? And Again, as an open access person, how do we make sure we're preserving them not behind sort of proprietary uh, walls and, and, and buildings. Um, so that is what I'd offer. I'd offer first, lay the smogasbord, the buffet out of possibilities. Communities make very good intuitive choices. They're deeply political and smart and strategic. But it may be about which form of knowledge is in which space. Daisy. Uh, Daisy from South Africa. I think for me, seeing my community, and I'm the only one who was here, what I was saying. There are a community up north, or no, it is Zimbabwe, and that's where the baobab trees are grown. So to see IKS in action, being in Boston, it's quite interesting, and to understand that 
those are the aunties that I know down the street, but it's IKS, what they were doing, and what commercialization has done with what you are trying to address to say, the Amarula liquor, that's how it's brewed as beer, it's passed down as part of IKS, but when commercialization comes in, they use e elephants to say, oh, but the Amarula trees, the fruit falls down, the, the, the elephants are the ones who are picking up the Amarula fruit, and then the elephants tremble, and then you get this Amarula liqueur. And what we were seeing, it's a real IKS process of how Amarula actually is fermented. So thank you for that. And if people want to know more, because I, I resonate, that's my community. It's one of the nine languages spoken in South Africa, but that's my community. And if you are observant, you can actually see the dress style. Each and every community, it's not a tribe. People tend to say, we don't, we don't have tribes, we have communities. And that's how they dress because of the Shreshwe outfit. And now it's much more, I'm, I'm aware that Louis Vuitton copied the Basutu ones <laughs> to make money. And now the trend in Africa is that, how can you want to spend $3,000 when you can buy that for $2, a two meter outfit for $2? And you know, th those are the dynamics around how we deal with knowledge and for who and IKS. Thank you so much for that, um, Daisy. And I will say, when I was trying to think of what to choose from People on Knowledge, which, as I said, is a deeply rich film, um, I chose the Amarillo section for you, because I knew you were in the room. And what Daisy is referring to as IKS is indigenous knowledge systems that, again, as I, as I said, is a field of research that many, many notable scholars are in the middle of thinking for their own communities and others, and I think we know very little of. But the other point that she's making, I think, which is really important, and I would like to sort of bring that into the room, is this is about the post-colonial manifesto, right? And we know that research has often been deeply extractive. But research is not extractive only of people's minds. It's also extract extractive of people's bodies. There is deep physical labor in the work that communities do around the world. And when that labor is, is taken from them, is, is seized from them, they are not given ownership of either their physical or their intellectual labor. That, to me, is one of the deepest forms of injustice we have today. Thank you so much for this beautiful, stunning talk and for getting us going this afternoon in this side. I just wanted to say how grateful I am. And, um, and what I wanted to just ask you about one of the items that you put forth um, for the research agenda, and that was under preservation. You had, you had a bullet that was um, how resilient. Mm -hmm. And um, and I started feeling deeply uncomfortable with the concept of resilience several years ago when I was reading environmental literary criticism and um, Susie O'Brien, who's a Canadian um, critic, um, sort of uh, made me see how much the rhetoric of resilience is often about sort of people's endless absorption of woes and suffering and positions, um, those folks were being lauded for being resilient um, as, uh, as folks who just have to absorb what comes at them and, and are not able to take ownership over, um, over their future. So I, I just, I wonder how you're thinking of resilience in this context and you know, is it about the material embodiments mm -hmm. of the knowledge mm -hmm. that, that are the things that need to have resilience or is there a human factor there? That is beautiful, and thank you. And it, I am thinking deeply about it, because I think I meant it as a combination of the two, in a sense. And the resilience I was talking about, for instance, is when Dalit people bring their knowledge online, how long does it last before it is taken down? When queer activists bring their histories online, how long does it last before it gets trolled and brought down? Right. So for me, the resilience was around preservation and memory. Right. And how do we honor? what has been produced, and then how do we honor keeping it there? But you are right. I, in some ways, we have used the word resilience in terms of emotional and physical um, resilience in a way that can be undermining. And so I do want to very much affirm what you're saying and, and just sort of reflect that, you know, Bell Hooks says this beautifully. Um, she says, endurance 
is not transformation. So maybe we talk about it as resilience and transformation, perhaps. So this is a bit of a plant, but <laughs> tell us more about what is on the horizon for Who's Knowledge. I have been so excited by some of the things you've done, and I know that there are more things in the works. And what, what kinds of campaigns are you Funny you should ask, Phoebe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you have friends in the audience. Um, so I'm really excited about what we're doing. And I know that in this talk, I brought so many of the other voices in, and I felt that responsibility to do so. But what we're doing right now, which is really exciting me, and please go look it up. It's on Twitter, hashtag VisibleWikiWomen. Let me see if I have that hashtag. There we go. Extra stuff. There, Visible Wiki Women Challenge, and that is with partners within the Wikimedia world and organizations, women's organizations from around the world, we're looking at the fact that only, you know, 17% of the biographies on Wikipedia are of women, but even of the ones that exist, and let's just say that has happened after enormous work by many of Phoebe and my friends and a whole lot of people we don't know, but it's gone from 14% to 17%, and that is enormous. And when you look at those biographies, they mostly don't have pictures. So invisibility is a form of structural violence. How do we change that? So we're running a challenge on bringing the photographs of notable women onto Wikipedia. And we're hoping that not only do biographies that exist get a picture, but also those who upload the pictures um, and who don't have Wikipedia articles, it inspires someone to write the Wikipedia article about them. So for instance, the first picture that I saw, which was wonderful, came, comes out of Mexico City. And a friend of ours um, uploaded it. And it's the photograph of Cecilia Santiago. And I don't know if any of you know Cecilia Santiago. I don't know how many of you love soccer or football. I do. Football made me a feminist. Um, that's another story. That's mm -hmm. But Cecilia Santiago is the first, is the youngest goalkeeper to ever play in a soccer World Cup of either or any gender, right? And I didn't know that. And today, the Wikipedia article, English Wikipedia article, and the Spanish Wikipedia article has a really beautiful photograph of Cecilia taken by one of our friends. Um, the other thing that we're hoping to do this year as we work with our communities is in July, just before Wikimania, which as many of you know, is the lovely conference that Wikimedians have once a year. Naturally, we call it Wikimania. Um, that's in Cape Town in July. Two days before that conference, we are holding a convening called Decolonizing the Internet. And we're hoping to bring together librarians, archivists, techies, uh, community organizers, those who work on internet access and security, to come into the conversation and start the conversation around how do we center marginalized communities on the internet? Because marginalized communities are the majority of the world. So thanks for the plant. So please join me again in thanking Anasuya. That was I, I'm so moved by the, the conversations and the threads and the, and the people um, who have already come together in less than two days of us doing this. It's, um, I'll just say I'm moved, because if I say any more, then I won't be able to say any more. Um, Thank you all so much. Thank you, Anasuya. Um, we're going to take a uh, quick break now um, and uh, say goodbye to our live stream folks for now. And we'll take a quick 10 minute break and reconvene back in this room um, to kick off the work that we're going to do uh, for a day and a half here uh, in the confines of this room with each other. So 10 minute break. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>